So this week is our final week on the series, Is Your Check Engine Light On? And we talked about this, is, is vehicles, when they start to have issues or they need oil changes, they have check engine lights that come on. And they kind of let us know when we're heading for trouble. And unfortunately, none of us, but we've all had friends that have had situations in their life that said, I didn't see it coming, or it came out of nowhere, or it just all blew up, and I, I don't know what to do. You know, I know that's not you, but some of your friends have had situations like this. And we're trying to, by the grace of God, avoid that, see some of that coming. It's so similar to a check engine light going on in our car, letting us know we're heading for a disaster. We need to do something that we can prevent that. Now, this morning, I'm, we got a lot of different personalities in the room. How many of you are like checklist people? Like you love checklists. Like you actually do something. Raise your hands. Just I want to see you. Okay, okay. You actually, I know some of you actually do something and then you forgot to write it on the checklist. So you go write it on the checklist just to cross it off. That's fantastic. You know, um, you know and then some of you like spreadsheet people. So you like spreadsheets, numbers, data, tracking, all that stuff. A couple people, a couple people here. Okay, sweet. So some of you, if we looked at this series, you kind of are the spot. You're like, man, I've got so many things wrong. It's like I, like, I can't, like, get ahead of this, and, like, this is, um, you know, maybe you feel guilty, maybe it's overwhelmed, maybe you're just kind of, like, ready to give up, you're like, I don't, I don't know how we're going to handle this. Like, it feels like every time we talk about one of these, I have another check engine light on it, and how do we process this? And this morning, like, this passage this morning is, is designed to give you hope and encouragement, it's designed to give all of us hope and encouragement, and kind of reorient our perspective just a little bit. Um, this morning... We're going to look at one of my favorite uh, people in the Bible. He's actually one of the 12 followers of Jesus, one of the 12 disciples. And he is the guy that kind of gets it all wrong. Now, his name, his name is Peter. So I want to know this guy. We're not going to look at every story from the Bible. Like, there's some, some amazing highlights that we'll have to skip over for the sake of time. But as we look at the life of Peter, I think we're going to see some incredible highs, some incredible lows, and then we're going to get to, there's, there's a verse in his last letter to the believers that I think is a really great um, summation of this series. A really great way to kind of wrap this up and give us something to focus on from here on out. Now, um, growing up, I've got a younger brother. He's about a year, year and a half younger than me. His name is Peter. And um, so in the, the Bible, the apostles, Andrew and Peter, were brothers. And so I always kind of read this, this passage and thought, I think my parents switched our names, you know? Because my younger brother, he's like the saint in the family. Everything is great and goes great. And then me, I'm always fumbling it up, you know? So if you, if you relate to the guy that fumbles it up this morning, this is going to be, you're going to love this. We're going to look at the story of Peter, and we're going to start with Jesus' calling of him. In Matthew 8, uh, 4, uh, verse 18, it says that while Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. So these would have been commercial fishermen. They, this is how they made their living. They provided their uh, livelihood, the food for their family, doing this. So they weren't just out, you know, not, nothing against recreational fishermen. Some of you don't hate on me. But I'm just, this is, they were doing this for a business. And so they were there doing their daily occupation. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And he says, and I will make you fishers of men. And what's incredible is these guys left the boat. They, they left everything. I mean, they didn't, they didn't look through the documents, the, you know, the legalese. They didn't see what their, you know, the compensation package was. You know, they get to the compensation page of their contract, and it's completely blank. And they're like, this is Jesus? Like, we're going to follow him. We're going to do whatever he says. And I think, what an incredible moment. Can you imagine being a... Can you imagine being at your job or, or, you know, just going about your daily life? And then this teacher walks by and he says, hey, he says, I want you to put everything down and just follow me. I mean, think of all the questions that start running through your head, right? I mean, wait, wait, for how long? Where are we going? What are we doing? Like, I want to pay my bills. Like, what will I tell my spouse when I get home? <laughs> and again, these guys just, they just left everything and they followed Jesus. Just an incredible um, highlight. We see another highlight of Peter's in Matthew 16. This is when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man, he's referring to himself here using an Old Testament um, title, who do people say that the Son of Man is? He's referring to himself. He says, who do people say that I am? Now what's interesting is he didn't take the disciples to Jerusalem, to the temple, to ask this question. In fact, he took them to a pagan city, a city that would have been surrounded by temples to other gods and to idols. 
And in the midst of all this, all, of all these options, he says, who do people say that I am? They said, the disciples said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So he, you know, they, they answer, well, you know, we've heard around different people think you're this prophet or that prophet, maybe come back to life, or a prophet very similar, a messenger from God. And Jesus says to them, he says, but who do you say that I am? Now, imagine going to a restaurant and like there's all these options there and, and someone says, well, what's on the menu? Well, you can just read off the menu, right? You just list off the options. There's this and this and this and this. And then someone says, okay, now what is the best item on the menu? And some of us were very opinionated. But that depends on a lot of things. Like what's their taste buds? How hungry are they? What do they like? Do they have any allergies? And in, in an infinite, more complex way, Jesus now turns the spotlight from just a broad, like who do people say that I am? And he focuses right on the disciples. He says, who do you say that I am? Peter speaks up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, if we've grown up in church, we've heard this. We might lose the, the impact and the risk of stating this. Here he says, he says you are the, the Messiah. Now, the Jews had been looking for a promised one to come to, to deliver them, that it was from God. And he says, so first of all, Peter says, you're the Messiah. And then second, he says, you're the son of the living God. Or is that, that your deity like, this was no small claim for, uh, for Peter to make. I mean, he would have grown up in, in the synagogues and hearing it, and he said, Jesus, you are the one that's been promised from the beginning of the Hebrew Scriptures, and you're also God. This would have been blasphemy if, he were, if it were not accurate. Jesus answered him, and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father... Who is in heaven. What an incredible risk Peter takes. I mean, Jesus says, who? who I mean? And that's where most of us would be like, if in schools, the teacher says, who knows the answer to this? Most of us are like, oh, if I look away, no one will pick on me, try to hide your face. Because you don't want to, what if we get it wrong? You don't want to get embarrassed in front of everyone. Peter steps up and he says, you're the Messiah and you're the Son of God. And Jesus says, you're blessed because the Spirit's revealed it to you. The Father in heaven has revealed that. Now, we go from this incredible moment of bravery, courage, and understanding. And if you notice, this is chapter 16, verse 16 and 17. And very shortly later, like three, four verses later, Peter ends up stepping in it. He says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. So Jesus is giving his followers, his 12 disciples, a heads up on what's coming. He says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, part of God's plan. is I'm going to go there. I'm going to be crucified, put to death by the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. But then on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Peter took him aside, and he began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now, some of us have had that, that, that awesome opportunity to be rebuked you know, as a parent, you know, our parents rebuked us growing up, or the coach would bring us aside, or the teacher, and they kind of said, let's have a talk. You know, they put their arm around you, and you're like, oh boy, like this never ends well. And this is what Peter does to Jesus. Peter's like, okay, come on, Jesus, let's, let's have a talk. And he's like, this is never going to happen. Far be it from you. Like, this is like, this is so far beyond imagination. This will never happen. Anyway, this is just the guy they had that moment of that awesome proclamation. And now he's um, scolding Jesus, rebuking Jesus. I mean, what a shift. Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Whoa. I mean, so he goes to this thing like, man, he says, Peter, you, know, you understand things from God. And now, listen, he's like, he says, your mind's not in the right place. He said, you're actually doing the work of Satan in this. He says, you're, you're enhancing the work of Satan. Whew, talk about a low, right? I mean, he goes, from, he goes from understanding things that nobody else had the bravery, the courage to understand, to then using that same bravery and courage to rebuke Jesus for messing up the plan. Here, for all following this, this is just the track record of Peter. 
He goes from here, and he walks on water. He has the courage and the faith to say, Jesus, come, tell me to come to you, and I'll walk on water. And he steps out of the boat, and he walks on water. Then he tells Jesus, like, he said, everybody's going to leave you, but I'm going to stick with you. That is, until the soldiers show up. Then I'm out of here. And, and he abandons Jesus in the moment of, of dire need. And Jesus brings him back and restores him. And, and we see that he went from this man who was cowering in the, in the slightest bit of intimidation. We f- see that towards the end of his journey in, in Acts chapter 4, that there's this moment of incredible bravery once again. It says, uh, at, this situation occurs after uh, G, uh, Peter and John, they went to the temple to, uh, to worship. As they're going there, this crippled man was there, and he's asking for money. He was begging because there was, wasn't a financial support system at the time. And so he's there begging, and he asks for some money, and, and Peter says, we don't have any money. He says, but how about we heal you in the name of Jesus? And the man gets up and walks, and it creates this huge stir because God forbid you actually heal somebody you know, in the temple when you're supposed to be worshiping. And so it creates this huge stir. And it says, on the next day, the rulers and the elders and the tri- uh, scribes they gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all those who are of the high priestly family. So all the bigwigs are getting together. All the religious leaders, all the authorities in Jerusalem, they're gathering together. It says, and when they'd set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? You know, here they're on trial. Peter and John are on trial for healing somebody in the name of Jesus. And they say, and they asked, why did you do this? What authority did you have to do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, then let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, Ouch, you know, kind of throws that jab in there. Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Now, Peter could have answered a lot of different ways. Like, by what authority did you do this? And like, um, Jesus? Instead, Peter's going to, no, he's going to take this opportunity. He launches into this sermon. He says, hey, he says, you want to know if, if we're really here standing in front of you to find out how this man was healed? Well, let me tell you. You remember the man that you crucified? Oh yeah, also the man that God raised from the dead. It's by his power that that crippled man is standing before you well. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. The builders, which has become the cornerstone. He, here, now he's really kind of pointing the finger at them. He says, you guys rejected Jesus. And God's still going to build the kingdom on Jesus. He says, you said no to God, and God doesn't care. God's moving on with his plan. And Peter, Peter is on a roll now. He can't stop. He says, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, Peter here, I mean, he stopped pulling. I mean, he's just, he's launched off into a full-out sermon now. He says, that you know, not only is this man healed and walking because of Jesus, but that Jesus is the only name by which anybody under heaven, which he's talking about the sky under the clouds, anyone at all on earth can be saved. Wow. And this is the guy that a month and a half before had run when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. When he was questioned, saying, hey, don't you know Jesus? He said, no, I've never heard of him. And he swore an oath that he had never heard of him. What a, what a change. What a transformation. The leaders there, they said, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated, common men. Remember what Peter was? He was a fisherman by trade. You know, he probably still looked a bit like a fisherman. Who knows, he might even smell like a fisherman still. And he's there, and they're looking at him thinking, isn't these guys aren't educated. I mean, they didn't go out of the top Pharisee schools. Like, they didn't, you know, they didn't get all those YouTube videos. And they're, they're just common men. They were astonished. 
They're just, their minds are blown. They're like, where does this guy come off telling us this stuff? Says, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They look at these guys and think, man, they're not that smart. They're not that sophisticated. They're just ordinary people from Galilee, which is kind of like a know-nothing area. And the only explanation that they could come up with was that these guys had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. So we see these highs and these lows, and some of us maybe even feel these highs and lows. What's Peter's, what's Peter's message? Well, I think in, that, in the second letter from Peter to the church, he, he writes this as a really interesting phrase. Peter says, he says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's interesting. He doesn't say, he says, achieve the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, or, or I hope you get it, or for some of you, that option is there, but he uses this, this idea, he says, grow. This idea of, of progress, that we're, we're, we're gaining ground, that it also implies it's not instantaneous. You know, we don't have instantaneous trees. I mean, some of us wish, wish that we could, we could hear a message or we see a scripture verse or we understand a truth and then we put it in the microwave and poof, like, you know, 30 seconds later, we've got it. It's part of our character. We're living it out. And yet what he says is that, that he's just he's telling this church that they, there's growth, that it requires time and energy and effort. And he says, grow in the grace that this is the divine enablement. It's God's power in our lives and also in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he says, at the end of the day, who gets the credit? To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. That Peter realizes at the end of his life, the only one that gets the credit is God. And he's the only one that can take the credit for this amazing transformation. I think this idea of growth is so important for us to understand. Some of us look at our life today and we feel like, man, I, I had a pretty good week or I had a pretty good day. I'm doing great spiritually. Some of us would look back and we're like, like, I feel like Peter, but not the up here kind of Peter. I feel like the, the down on the rocks Peter. That, that I, I got caught up in the same thing again, or I'm so struggling, or I'm, I'm not growing. And what I want us to do today is just look at a couple questions. And some of us might look at these questions and say, oh, I've got so much room to grow. And that might be true. But I want us to look and say, okay, the Spirit of God promises to work in our lives and, and make progress. And so we look at these the question isn't, the question that should not set off of the dashboard isn't that, okay, have we room to grow? Because the obvious answer for each one of us is yes. Why do, why do I know that? Well, we're not dead yet. You know, when we're in heaven and we're perfect, then we won't have any room to grow. The fact that we're sitting here on earth still breathing and eating and drinking water means we have room to go. We could distance the gain still. But the question is that, is that if we look back, and I'm not saying just 30 seconds or 30 minutes, but even over the years, do we see God working in our life? Do we see growth? Do we see progress from where we were? That doesn't mean that we don't have room to go, but do we see progress to where we're at? A couple questions. One is, am I following Jesus more closely? Like today, am I following Jesus more closely than I did when I started? That am, I, am I more committed to, to following him, to obeying him, to kind of being, doing what Peter did, say, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. Doesn't mean there's never been a detour. You're saying, yes, I'll follow you. Am I growing in control of my mouth? Now, some of you, God bless you, you guys think you're quiet, you can control everything you say, and nothing that you don't intend ever slips out of your mouth. For the rest of us, okay? Like this is going to be a little support group kind of time. You know, some of us, I mean, oh my word. I mean, even James talks about who can control the tongue, right? Some of us feel like that about, like, why did I just say that? That's the dumbest thing to say. And yet, have we ever had those moments where we look back and we're like, wow, I normally would have responded this way, and I didn't. Maybe it was only one time, but I, I, I didn't. Like, God's Spirit's at work. Am I growing in control of my mouth? Are there things that, that I normally would have said that I no longer do? Are there things that I, I, I used to keep my mouth shut, and now I actually say the right thing? Am I growing in control of my mouth? Am I growing in, in my patience with others? This doesn't mean this is perfect. 
But is there, is there growth in this idea of patience, that, that this endurance, that the things that used to just really drive us crazy, we can kind of just say, we can let go, we can extend grace that we want to receive. That we can say, yeah, there's, they're messed up just like I am. Are we growing in patience? Are we growing in, our, in my forgiveness? You know, when, when before we came to Christ, before we had that relationship with Christ, man, we, we had to hold every account. So, for some of us, we would write these down. We thought of it as like, like, these are the people I'm going to get even with. Or maybe we would we'd never write them down on paper. We just put them in our mind, and we rehearse them so we don't forget them. And we say, here are the people I can never forgive, and here's what I hope happens to them. <laughs> All right, now, your friend did that, right? You got a fr- everyone's got a friend. And, and the reality is, though, is, is we come to understand that the, the complete and utter forgiveness that we receive from Jesus, that, that we start loosening our grip just a little bit on the things that have been done wrong to us. Because if we say, God forgives me everything, then I should probably let some of these things go. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't take care of them still, because he is, and justice will be done. But it's just that I'm not the judge. That God's going to execute justice on this. Am I growing in my forgiveness? Am I growing in my trust for God? Wouldn't it be awesome if like the path from where God has you to the path where God wants you was just like perfectly straight? Would it feel awesome, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't it be great, even as a church, families, we've been kind of working through this transition. If they say, we need a new building, there's a bright light that shines from heaven on the new building, all the money shows up in your bank account, and there's movers that come to move your stuff from one to the other. That would be fantastic. I mean, that would just be so easy. And yet we would miss out learning something about God. And this crazy journey that if you've been following, that God has led us on, and these changes in direction and course and you know, increased cost and increased provision. And I mean, it feels, like, it feels like a journey with no map sometimes. And yet as we approach the end of that, what has it done? It's increased our trust for God. That we've seen God work. We've seen God show up. We've seen God do things that only God can do. And so that together, as a church family, that we say, wow, our trust in God has grown because God didn't lead us on the straight and easy path. He led us on that old goat trail with seemingly no signs, and yet his provision was there. Am I growing in my, in my trust for God? Do I... Trust God with things that once would have just sent me into sheer panic. Because I know that he's had it all along and he'll control it still. And this ties into contentment. Am I growing in contentment? See, if we trust God and he's got it all under control, then I can be content with that. Like, I don't have to know every single thing and how it's going to play itself out. I don't have to control every detail because he has it under control. And while we have things we might think would be better or ways that God could do things better or paths that we think might be easier, because we learn to trust him, we learn to be content in that. You know, contentment isn't a natural human condition. And so if we see and find ourselves being content, that's the spirit of God that's been working in our hearts to bring us to that point. And am I, and am I growing in my ability to reach others? You know, is there... Is there some increase that we've seen God do? Because when we start naturally our journey with God, I mean, just like a newborn kid, we're just focused about us. Like, we need to grow, and we need nutrients, and, and we need people to watch out for us. And that's natural. That's normal. That's okay. But as we grow, we started to notice that, shockingly, others have needs around us too. And that sometimes God's given us the ability to, to speak that word of encouragement to come alongside them and, and help them, to show them God's love, to communicate the gospel to them, that good news. Am I growing in my ability to reach others? This doesn't mean we don't, we don't blow it, we don't miss opportunities. Because if, if anyone said that, you'd probably just be lying. But this means that we're improving in that, that we're growing in that. And that growth is supernatural. When God called Peter, he said, I will make you fisher of men. You know what he didn't say? Is how quickly. It's not like he gave him a hat that said, fishers of men, and then he was instantly it. It was this process that he brought him on. What we see from the life of Peter is that no amount of success is final, and no amount of failure is final. 
If we're, if we're like, you know, on cloud nine and everything is just going spectacular and we couldn't imagine it better, then we probably need to be careful. Because if we look at the life of Peter, you know, some, some negative detours are along the way. But maybe we kind of relate to the, the negative side of Peter. We're like, man, I've messed up this and I should have done that and I knew better on this situation and we've been talking about it and I feel like every single light on my dashboard is on. And like, you know, there's not many good things going left. I mean, technically the antenna's still attached to my car, but that's about all I got going on. And yet looking at the story of Peter should bring us immense hope. That for those catastrophic failures of denying Jesus and telling Jesus he had the wrong plan and Jesus to call you a teammate of Satan, you know, and running at every opportunity that you had to run, that God can, God can and is committed to bringing to that point of restoration. Because failure isn't final with the grace of God. The, the question isn't, are we where we should be? The answer is no. But the question is, are we growing to where we should be? Are we, are we making progress? And we don't have to be, feel defeated. We don't have to feel discouraged. Because God is committed to our growth. In fact, he's more committed to our growth than we are. And he says, I'll complete this journey for you and with you. The question is, are we growing? Our failure is not final. Our failure is disappointing. It might be frustrating. It might be embarrassing. But it's not final. God says we can grow. That no failure is final. That our growth is what he wants us to focus on. So the simple question this morning is, are we growing? Are we making progress to being more like Jesus? To loving him more? To loving others more? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much that you forgive our failures, that through the blood of Jesus that it covers our sin, that, that we could have those horrific moments like Peter did of, of failure and denial and doubt, and yet we could be restored to places of growth and usefulness and triumph. We thank you this morning that if, we are, if we're flying high, that if we feel like our walk with you is close, that um, obedience is easy. We know that's only by your grace. And we want to give you the credit for that and that we thank you for sustaining us. And if we're, we're in a spot of difficulty or struggle or maybe discouragement, that we don't, we're not growing as fast as we would like or the journey isn't quite how we expected or that the detours are, are further and harder than we wished, that we can look at the, the snapshots from the life of Peter and find courage, not because... He was able to man up and overcome, but because your spirit kept bringing him back. That there's always a place for forgiveness, for restoration, and for future victory. And we thank you for that. Or help us not to fixate on the, the, how we measure up to our own checklist, but help us to focus on the question, are we growing? Where can we look at the spirit's work in our lives and celebrate and give thanks? We, we all have room to go. We all have distance to achieve. We all have um, areas that you're still, in to, still working on us. But we thank you for your work so far. We ask that you would help us to continue with that in the process. We pray these things in your name. Amen. This morning, as we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're celebrating exactly what Peter was telling those leaders. We're celebrating that the one who died for him, that Jesus who was who was crucified and risen from the dead, was the Messiah. He was the promised one from God. And that it was through him that not only that we have, we have physical life, but that we have new life, spiritual life. It's through that, that same Jesus that restored Peter back to a place of usefulness. And so we celebrate this morning as we celebrate that continual hope that the blood of Jesus is sufficient and capable for washing our sins, for cleansing us from all unrighteousness, and bringing us complete before the throne of God. Ask the ushers to come and hand out the elements and then we'll take them together at the end. Together as we take the bread, we give thanks and we remember Jesus' body was broken for our sin. We take the cup rejoicing for his blood shed for our forgiveness. This morning we have the opportunity to pray for our friends at Centerpoint Church in Portland. Um, it's a newer church plant the last couple of years. 
And so just praying for God's uh, clear direction and uh, provision for them. And it's the opportunity that they have, similar to what Peter did of sharing that gospel, that the Spirit of God would work in hearts and cause people to respond to that. So we'll pray for our friends at the center point. And then um, I'll ask you to join me as we pray and ask God for the opportunity for us, each one of us, to share his love. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace uh, shown. Um, We thank you for the grace in our own lives. We thank you for the grace shown to our friends at Center Point. We ask um, this morning for your rich blessing on them, that your word and your spirit would work in in their, uh, their body, that you would unite them, and that you would bring them fruit for their ministry. We ask that as you provide them opportunities to share the gospel, that you would uh, connect um, in your spirit would work in hearts and lives and draw people to Jesus. And uh, we thank you for them, and we ask for your richest blessings on them. Uh, and let's pray together. God, please give me one person to share your love with today. In Christ's name, amen. God bless.